And the big question, can you water bath, can anything? Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to my kitchen. So I have had a very, very highly requested video, if not the most requested video in the last little while on my channel and that video is on canning and just how to can and those sorts of things. So I decided I'm going to create this video, title it Canning 101. We're gonna dive into the big question right now is, um, can you water bath anything? We're gonna talk about the difference between pressure canning and water bath canning and all those sorts of things. But I need to insert a disclaimer here and that is, this is how I do these things. I am not telling you this is how you should do these things. Um, this is my kitchen. These are my rules that I stay within in my kitchen and it's just how I do these things. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more of those kinds of topics in the second half of this video. The first half, I'm gonna to explain to you the difference between water bath canning and pressure canning and kind of how to do those things. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about some topics like rebel canning, which you may have heard of before, and the big question, can you water bath can anything? So let's start off with just what is water bath canning? What is pressure canning? So water bath canning is an old way of canning. It's how they canned things in jars like you see behind me. Um, long before there was a pressure canner around or people used pressure canners in their homes. And basically the idea behind water bath canning is you just need a pot or a kettle that is a little bit deeper than whatever jar you're going to be canning with. And generally with a normal canner that you buy in the store these days, there is a rack that sits in the bottom. And basically that's there because you want something between the bottom of the pan and your jar because you may end up with some burnt stuff in your jar if you don't have something between there. I know that in years past, my mom in a pinch has put a dish towel in the bottom of her canner or kettle when she was canning something um, just to kind of give a buffer there. I think I've even done that when you can't find your rack or maybe you have a problem with your rack, it's broken or something like that. Um, we've done that. Again, that would not be the by the book way to run a, <laughs> a water bath canner. But like I said, I'm just going to give you the little things that I have done or my mom or my mother-in-law has done. So um, basically what you wanna do is you start out with clean jars and this is a preference thing. Some people like to have their jars really, really hot um, when they start out. Generally, I do not. Um, I've never had a problem with my jars cracking or anything. That's usually why people do that is they will have their jars really hot when they're putting hot liquid into the jars if you are hot packing and we'll get to that word in just a second. So I personally generally just start out with room temperature jars and then I just load them up and you wanna have your rings and lids ready. So I'm gonna break some of that stuff down here in a minute, but I just wanted to kind of tell you the idea around water bath canning. So once you have the lids and the rings on your jars, um, then you will get your jars in the water and you definitely want the water to be around the temperature of whatever is inside your jars. So if you're cold packing something, then maybe you want room temperature water. If you're putting boiling hot chili into some jars and you're getting ready to can that, then you definitely want the water inside your canner to be pretty hot as well. Hey guys, so I just wanted to take a minute to say a big thank you to Care Of for sponsoring this week's video. Care Of is a subscription service that ships you high quality vitamins, supplements, and powder 
powders. They come to your door every month, so you don't need to go anywhere for them. I know for myself, I've been going into kind of a new season of life with different health concerns, so finding out what supplements and vitamins I should be taking can feel a bit overwhelming, but Care Of makes it really, really simple. They simplified all of this by creating a quiz that asks you questions about your lifestyle and your health concerns to match you up with some high quality products that will help you in any areas of concern you may have. For me personally, you all know I like to stay as organized as I can, so having the vitamins put into small packets that I can just grab every day is very convenient, particularly if I'm on the go and I'm just going to be running out the door, I won't miss out on taking my vitamins because I can throw them right into my bag and keep on going. A few of my concerns were energy and making sure that my iron levels were in the place they need to be, so having the extra iron in my packet is so helpful, plus taking some rhodiola to help pick up my mood and give me a little bit more energy is also so great. So they've thought of everything they've covered all the things that I was concerned about and shared with them in the quiz and I'm really happy with the packet they sent me another thing that they provided me with was some excellent collagen it's something that just helps my skin it's easy for me to add in to my coffee or tea since I got the kind that doesn't have any flavor in it so it adds a little bit of an extra pick-me-up in my morning routine and even as seasons of life come and go care of changes with you so you can retake the quiz to just readjust your plan and how you want to care for yourself. So go ahead and click on the link in the description box to take the care of quiz to see what vitamins and supplements they would recommend for you and you can use my code to get 50% off of your first care of order. So as a general rule, you just want your water and the, the contents inside your jar to be the same temperature. So you're going to bring your water bath to a rolling boil and not just a little simmer. You want it to be really boiling. So at that point, that's when you start your processing time. So say you're canning peaches. Um, I think normally they are water bathed for like 15 minutes if it's a quart of peaches. So at that point, you would set your timer for 15 minutes. When your timer goes off, you pull out your jars and you set them aside. And we'll get to the ceiling and all of that in a little bit. So that's the basic idea around water bath canning. And I just did some grapes and made grape juice not that long ago. So the simple steps of it is you put the grapes inside. And this is not for every single thing that you could be canning. I'm just giving this as an example. You put your grapes inside, you don't cook them, you don't blanch them, you don't do anything. And then I added a fourth cup of sugar to each jar of grapes. I topped it off with some water, giving myself about, oh, I'd say a little less than an inch headspace. Headspace is the amount of space between the water level in your jar or broth level or whatever you're canning and your lid at the top. And that is kind of important depending on what you're canning. Certain things won't seal very good if they if you don't have enough space in there and you've got stuff oozing out through your seal and all of that. And so I gave myself about uh, maybe an inch headspace with the water, I sealed it on with the lid and the ring, and I put it in the water bath canner. Of course, the water was about room temperature because the water that I put in with the grapes was about room temperature, brought it all up to a boil, and then I um, set the timer. I think it was also 15 minutes to process that. And then when I was done, I pulled out my jars, and because it cooked the grapes, inside that boiling water. It made my grape juice for me in the jar, which I love recipes like that, where you're basically doing something called cold packing. So um, before we move on to those, some of those terms and words, we're gonna talk a little bit about pressure canning. So pressure canning is basically what it sounds like. You are canning something through pressure. So every pressure canner has its own manual, has its own instructions, its own way of doing things. And I recommend 
really leaning into using your manual for your pressure cooker uh, or your pressure canner. I don't want to say pressure cooker. Someone asked that question in one of my last videos. Is a pressure cooker and a pressure canner the same thing? They are not the same thing. A pressure cooker would be like an Instapot where it's a little bit like a crock pot that uses pressure. A pressure canner is built a little bit differently. So you wanna definitely follow all the instructions in your manual for your pressure canner. I will leave the link below for the one that I have. Um, but the general rule is pretty similar. You basically start out with clean jars. You pack your jars, however you're gonna do it. Put the lids on, put the rings on. You put them inside of your pressure canner. My pressure canner um, uses three quarts of water no matter how much, how many jars I have inside. So I load it with three quarts of water. I clip the lid in after checking my seals and everything. And then I turn the stove on. And once it comes up to a boil, there's a little hole at the top that allows steam to come out. And so once I start to see the steam coming out, knowing everything's really boiling inside that pressure canner, then I have a little kind of, I, I think it's called a weight, but it's a little piece that sets on top of that valve or that hole where the steam comes out. Once you set it on there, it's going to start to build pressure inside the pressure canner because it doesn't have anywhere else to go. The steam has nowhere else to go besides to build the pressure inside. So as it does that, there's a gauge on top and it's going to lift up to whatever uh, amount of pressure you need for your recipe. So like if you're doing pints of ground hamburger, <laughs> you would want to, for, for my altitude, I would be doing 10 pounds of pressure for an hour and 15 minutes. So ev depending on where you live, depending on what sea level you are at, that your manual will give you instructions on where you want your pressure to be. So once you've hit that, so if I hit the 10 pounds pressure, I usually turn my stove back just a little bit. So you want it to just sit at that. And sometimes it can be a little tricky. So say it goes over the 10 pounds of pressure, then I just move the valve a little bit at the top. I let some steam out and it goes, psh, you know, letting the steam out and that brings the pressure down and it kind of sets you back where you want to be. Or if you don't have enough pressure, it means you need to turn up your stove a little bit to add heat to create more steam. So it's really not that hard and there's a lot of fit like valves and things on it where if you were to forget about it or like something were to happen, it's gonna blow those little safeties before it blows up because that's always the big question. Will it blow up on me? <laughs> so it really, at this point, the way that pressure canners are designed, they almost can't blow up on you. I mean, they would blow a valve or something like that first. So all of that to say, that's pretty much how you do it. So once you're, once you're up to your pressure, you'll set your timer. So say your timer's for an hour and 15 minutes, you set your timer, you, you keep an eye on it. You do have to babysit it a little bit um, versus the water bath canning. And you just make sure that it stays right at that um, pressure or that pound, that amount of pressure. And once the timer goes off, then I like to remove mine from the heat. I slide it over. I think some people may leave it on the heat. I'm not sure. Um, and then I just let the pressure naturally release. And I um, then once the pressure is completely released, you can take the lid off and you take the, the jars out and you let them cool. So that is just in a nutshell what the difference in those two things are. So I'm just gonna um, kind of show you a few other things really quickly here. So I'm gonna talk about jar size. Um, sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't. Um, you may have some canning recipes that will say to can something longer um, because it's a quart versus a pint. So like this jar of pickles I have back here is a pint. And there's different brands of jars and lids. And then you can see all of these here. This is a berry sauce. This is some pumpkin. I've got potatoes here. These are all quarts, which by the way, since we were talking about the grape juice, I did bring a jar of grape juice up. So this is what it looks like when it's completely done. 
And then the step you need to do to get your grape juice is I open this up, I dump it through a um, strainer, and I kind of usually take a spoon or a whisk inside the strainer just to make sure that the grapes are really smashed in there. And then I've got, I've obviously used something underneath to catch all your grape juice. And then I usually add the equal amount of water. So this is a little bit of a concentrate. You could definitely drink it just the way that it is. So just to touch on, there is more than quarts and pints. Um, there is jelly jar size, which are eight ounces. This one right here and this one right here are actually the same amount of ounces. They're just a different shape. Um, and we're gonna get into the lid part. So besides the jelly jars, the pints, the quarts, there's half gallon jars. And then there's also really, really small jars that's half the size of a jelly jar. Um, and those things you would not normally use, although you may find something you wanna use them for like olives or some really spicy peppers or something like that. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to lids. So there's two sizes of lids that is the general canning lids in the canning world. And that is a large mouth and a regular mouth. That's what they call these. So these are the lids, or some people call these flats, and these are the rings. And on the backs, they have a rubber seal. So personally, what I do is I um, take the rings off. There's always, there's some people like to leave their rings on. I like to take mine off so that I know I don't have a faulty seal that's pretending it's sealed underneath of my ring. And that's why I take them off, is to make sure that I know they're sealed and I can pick them up by the lid. Use this one as an example. Um, you would pick it up like this, hanging on to the lid to make sure that it's actually sealed. It is getting a little dark on me. I'm gonna turn on some lights here quickly and we'll keep going. All right, sorry, we're hitting evening time and I just wanna keep telling you about this, but the sun is going away and it's a really foggy, dreary day as well. Okay, so years ago, it was recommended by a lot of jar brands to boil the lids, boil the flats. So some people will boil their flats um, and they will use a magnet to pick them up out of the boiling water and put them on the jar before they put them into the canner. So that is again something that you can decide whether it's something you want to do. Now there is a big, big question out there <laughs> and we're gonna touch on that a little bit when I'm finished explaining the next couple of things, but that's whether or not to reuse your lids. Do you recan with your flats? So we'll get, about, we'll get into that in just a minute. One other term that I want to talk about that I mentioned is cold packing versus hot packing. So it's pretty much what it sounds like. Hot packing is when you've got something that's hot and like broth or something like that that you are putting into your jars and you are putting right into the canner and I went over that on the temperature of the water. Cold packing is when you are taking something that is either cold or room temperature and you're packing your jars. So a lot of times cold packing is referring to something that is raw. So if you're cold packing chicken, you're dicing up your chicken, you're putting it in to your jars and you're putting cold water on it or room temperature water, that is raw. And so because of the temperatures of everything that I'm talking about, it will cook inside of the canner. And that's how I prefer to can things, is to put them in raw and then can them. That way I'm not double, triple cooking things because you may cook it again when you get it out of the jar. It's just best to raw pack when you can. So um, along with that, there are some vegetables that I do blanch before I put into jars. And mainly the reason for that, because you might be saying it's gonna boil inside the jar. Why would you already boil it again? Because blanching is basically dropping something in to boiling water for only a few minutes and then pulling it out to stop the cooking. So like with cabbage and with um, bell peppers, which I just showed you all not that long ago. If you were to put them in raw, you're really not gonna get very much in your jar because of how they're shaped. Cabbage would be very difficult to shove the jar full and then end up with kind of your cooked cabbage only being this much at the top of your corn jar. So blanching it actually softens the vegetable just enough 
to put it into the jar and to be able to pack your jar well. So those are the basics of canning. Now, once everything comes out of the canner, this is again, kind of a preference thing. A lot of people have a very strict rule where they leave their things, sit on a towel or, you know, hot pads, whatever you're going to put your jars on once they come out of the canner and they let them sit there for 24 hours, no matter what, they really want to make sure the seals seal. I personally wait a few hours. Once I see they've all sealed, I'm not really afraid to move them to their shelves or to a different location. Um, once you've done a lot of canning, you can kind of tell once things have sealed and I've never had a seal unseal because I moved the jar. So once they're sealed, you can label them however you like and you can take the rings off if you choose to do that. I hope that I broke all of that down well enough. Please utilize the comments, leave comments below. I will do my best to answer them the best that I can. Okay, so if you've done canning, some canning, then you probably already know everything I just said, but now we're gonna talk a little bit about rebel canning, which is kind of a new word in the last couple of years, and we're gonna talk about water bath canning. There is another type of canning that you can do, which is very controversial, <laughs> But it's worth mentioning, especially leading into what we are talking about with rebel canning, and that is called open kettle. And that's another old method. A lot of Amish use this method, and Amish and Mennonites use this method of canning. And it's not, of course, considered to be the safest method. And that is, say you're making relish, it's particularly convenient for relish because there's a lot of vinegar in relish and so I feel like you can kind of get away with it, but you're, you take on your own rules for your kitchen, um, but you would boil your relish in a pot. You would have it cooking and you would really let it boil for a while. I mean, at least probably 20 to 30 minutes where you've got a rolling boil. So it is hot, it is cooked through and through and through. <laughs> and then you can take that and put it into a jar. You put your lid on, and in this point, uh, in this uh, method, a lot of people do boil their lids. You put the lid on, put the ring on, you screw it on tight and you flip it upside down or finger tight. Finger tight's another uh, phrase I didn't really mention. Finger tight just means that you screw it on just so that it starts to tighten with your fingers. And then you flip it upside down on a uh, towel or something like that and you let it sit there for 24 hours and generally they seal. Now, again, a lot of people would not practice that method, but I'm giving this information as information and you do with it whatever you want to do with it. So talking about rebel canning slash water bathing everything, because <laughs> there that goes hand in hand. There are some rebel canning recipes for um, pressure canning as well, because there are certain things that are not FDA approved and all of that but um, a lot of the rebel canning is associated with water bathing everything. So before I even go into this, um, I wanna give you a little bit of a background on me. So uh, my parents both come from a Mennonite background. My husband's parents come from a Mennonite and Amish backgrounds. And so this is coming from like probably at least 100 sources <laughs> through our families that we have done for generations. And that is water bath canning everything. I'm actually relatively new to pressure canning myself. So basically the idea is water bathing, meat water bathing, anything. And the big word that goes along with this and when people are researching and studying and all of that is the word balsam. And balsam is a bacteria that's odorless, it's tasteless, it's something that you cannot taste in your food and it is something that through the years they've discovered can be created in home canned goods if they are low acid and they are not pressure canned. Now a few things surrounding this whole thing of water bathing. Number one is that balsam comes from plants. Um, it comes through that. I don't understand all of the science behind it and you can write your comments below on the sciences behind it, but I'm just giving my position on this. Um, there is almost, 
from what I understand and from what I have researched, really no huge record of meat ever carrying balsam. Um, because it comes from plants and the earth, uh, when you're canning meat, unless somehow your meat got entangled with vegetables or you were canning meat and vegetables together, there isn't really a way for that to be in meat from what I've read. So again, you can put your opinions in the comments and all of that, that's okay. Um, so because of this, and because of the temperatures it needs to reach for that, that is why people have stopped water bath canning certain things and will only pressure can certain things. So we're gonna go flipping back to tradition. We're gonna go back to the generations in my, not only my family, not only my husband's family, but lots and lots of other people that we know that have water bath canned everything for years and generations. Um, there has been very few, I personally, with all the people that I know that water bath can things, I don't know anyone that's ever is so sh had an issue with balsam or anything like that. So that's just my viewpoint. It's where I get things. So all of that to say, there is rules when it comes to canning, no matter what kind of canning you're doing. So generally when it comes to meat, and those sorts of things, or even low acid um, vegetables like green beans, things like that. When you're gonna water bath can them, you are going to have to can them for three hours. And I know that might seem like a crazy long time, but <laughs> that is how long you have to water bath can something that would normally be put into the pressure canning aisle, if that makes sense. So I'm gonna go ahead and reference something here. Um, this is a book and I will link it below. It's on Amazon and it's the Mennonite Country Style Recipes and Kitchen Secrets. And this book has information on pressure canning, but it also has a very big list, and I'm gonna see if I can find it, for the times of water bath canning versus pressure canning and how to transfer that over. So again, this is a really big topic that a lot of people get on and I know back when I started sharing my canning recipes and things I was doing, a lot of people were like, you can't do that, you know, telling, telling me that this is not the way that the FDA says we should do things. Another thing to keep in mind about a lot of canning that's questionable out there is a lot of it hasn't been tested. Um, for example, like canning milk and things like that. That is something that lots of people have done for a long time is canned milk, but it's something that the FDA has not put a lot of money and time into researching. So you have to really consider that, that some of it is put on the no-go list because it's not been researched by their standards in their labs and all of those sorts of things. So I guess you have to decide if you wanna go down that road or you know if you see that there is an entire community of people like the Amish who are living and thriving and have water bath canned things for generations. So those are just all thoughts. And I'm, I may, if you've never heard of any of this, I might be sparking some interest to research it more. Definitely look into it more yourself. Um, along with rebel canning is the idea of whether or not to reuse your lids. So the main thing with reusing lids would really be that the seal wouldn't seal and you would end up with moldy, disgusting food inside. So I personally reuse my lids. Um, some of the tips in some of the Mennonite and Amish books that I have about reusing lids is they will actually take the lids that have already been used and boil them and they will put a little bit of baking soda in the boiling water to soften up that rubber seal on the inside and reuse it. Um, I know that my mom and my mother-in-law, they all reuse their lids. Um, and I personally, and this is kind of the way that they do as well, you flip the lid over on the back here 
and I inspect the seal. <laughs> I make sure that nobody's taken a fork, which is the worst thing you can do, and dug it to pop it off of the old jar. Um, I generally take a butter knife and stick it under the lip and pop up, so then it saves the lid. Um, and as far as reusing lids in all the canning I've done, and I have canned hundreds of jars, I've never had a reused lid not seal on me. And I may have one someday, <laughs> but to this day, I in the years I've done it, I've never had one reseal on me if I'm inspecting the lid and making sure that it is in proper running order to seal a jar. So um, just remember you're using the rubber again and that rubber is getting boiled if you are doing a water bath canner or if you're doing a pressure canner then it's truly getting to very hot temperatures to where it's softening up and it's hugging the rim of the jar again and it does a great job and like I said if your jar does not seal which is the main fear in reusing jar lids you will know <laughs> it will not work properly you will have spoiled food inside and you will smell it and that is one of the things that goes along with all of these different questions is just using some common sense on whether or not to reuse something so the other part too that i don't think i mentioned before if you're completely new and you've never done any canning is there is a little give you can see to the top of this when it's sealed it will be pushed down and you can't mess around with it if it's not sealed you're going to be able to pop it up and down just like that so that is one way usually i press the top of my jars when i'm done once they've cooled down and i also do the pickup test where you pick it up by the the lid and obviously if it is not sealed it's gonna drop pop right off the jar and you don't have a seal so another question when it comes to lids is should you use like a spaghetti jar? And my mother-in-law for years, <laughs> she's probably grinning at this, but for years has reused jars from the store and canned in them and use the lid that comes with the spaghetti jar, tightening it on and it seals just fine for her. And again, I know that she inspects the bottoms of her lids to make sure that the rubber seal is good to make sure there's no mold on the rubber seal. That can happen a lot with like spaghetti jars and stuff like that from the store and just making sure that it's all in running order. So those are some tips and tricks for things that are kind of considered a no-no. And along with that is the thing of canning any type of dairy, all of those things. I, I can butter. <laughs> I actually have not canned any cream cheese, but I have some that I want to try it out. So um, all of that stuff has went really well for me. And obviously one of the key parts of all of this is to have very sanitary, clean things you're working with. Your jars must be clean. You don't want bacteria involved anywhere. Um, so one of the questions you guys might have is if you've water bathed everything, why did you get a pressure canner? <laughs> so one of the reasons that I have is I can a lot, a lot. I love having canned goods on the shelf. I mean, you can see behind me, I've got all kinds of canned things and this isn't even close to all of the things I have in my cellar. Um, but I often am canning throughout the week. It's not like it's one whole day. It's just a part of my day is to be canning or putting a load in the canner. And with water bath canning, canning comes a lot of heat and steam that is left into your kitchen. I do have a stove that's in my basement. And so generally that is where I end up doing a lot of my water bath canning um, because I can open up my basement door. I can have a fan running. Um, I have a dehumidifier that I can kind of run it. If I do a long water bath can, like something that's three hours up here, it gets very, very hot. Now the benefit to water bath canning is you don't have to babysit it 
like you do a pressure canner. So it kind of depends on what I'm doing that day on what I'm going to do. Also with pressure canning, the time that is put into it is a lot less. So a lot of meats, if it's a pint of ground hamburger, it might be an hour and 15 minutes versus three hours or some people even do four hours water bath canning. So that time difference is pretty significant. And when you're pressure canning, you're keeping all of the steam inside. So my kitchen doesn't get hot. It's all contained right there on the stove top. And so that is also very convenient is that it's all in there. It's not putting moisture into my kitchen and it's just faster to be honest. So, but then there's other times where I might be canning with my sister-in-law or something like that. And we might be doing huge batches of stuff, you know, where we're doing 60 or more quarts in a day. And I have two water bath canners, which means I can run 14 quarts at a time. And I don't have to check on them, make sure their pressure's right, all of that. So, those are the reasons why I sometimes will pick one or the other, um, but I've been really liking my pressure canner just for the simple fact that I can do small batches of stuff almost every day while we're working on homeschooling or anything like that. And um, I can kind of be checking on it and kind of be doing something else and it takes a lot less time. So I do have the pressure canner that I can double stack and even in water bath canners, you can do that as well. Not with quartz, but with pints, where you put a layer of pints on the bottom, and then you just kind of stack another layer of pints on the top, and that's very, very convenient. Um, in my pressure canner, I can do 20 pints uh, as well as my water bath canner. So those are some of the questions I've had. That is some of the reasoning of why I might do one or the other, and, my, it's how I run my kitchen and it's how I have for a long time. It's how my mom has, my mother-in-law, my grandmother. <laughs> it's how we have done things. And so I thought that it would be worth sharing because you may be having some of the same questions. You may be doing some of your own research. So I thought I would go ahead and just give you what I know about it and what I've done for a very long time and you can look into more on balsam and just reading about different opinions or different research that's been done. It is worth understanding and knowing and then you can make the decision from there on how you want to operate your kitchen. So I'm, I think that's everything I wanna to share today. I hope that this was like helpful to those of you that have had a lot of questions and it's really not that difficult to can and it's oh so convenient to have the things on the shelf and ready to go. The thing that we probably use most in our house is canned potatoes, <laughs> which is right back here. Um, we use them probably at least three times a week. I have to can roughly at least 200 pounds of potatoes a year just because of how much we use them. Um, they're already cooked in there, so they're great to drain off and throw in the pan with some butter and fry right up. I slice them thin sometimes for breakfast potatoes, and they also work great in soups. And I'm gonna kinda lean out of the way and just point to what these things are so I don't get the questions in the comments. So this here is apple pie filling. Um, above that is tomato soup. Had to look at it, make sure it wasn't salsa. Um, this is a sweet pepper relish that I love and sometime I'm gonna share with you all the recipe for that, I think. This here is mandarin oranges. When I hit a good sale of those, I snag them, especially in January, February, that's when they are in season. And this year I may actually just get a big box of them and do a bunch because my girls love those as snacks. This here is asparagus and canned asparagus tastes very similar to green beans. That's just what our opinion in our house is. This here is canned strawberries and I wish so bad I would have started canning strawberries and blueberries years ago. I used to freeze them and I just got them out of my freezer and I've been doing this. And one of the reasons is because not only are they very similar to thawed out frozen strawberries, they don't have that freezer taste and you get the juice as well. And we use that in homemade yogurt. We use that to make strawberry lemonade. 
Um, there's so many uses for this. I've even used it in kombucha and things like that. I love having canned strawberries on my shelf. This right here is actually something that I, I open kettle can since I mentioned that earlier. And that is a mustard relish. We love that in our house too. We eat burgers at least once if not twice a week so having relishes and things like that is really important in our house so here <laughs> i've got green beans this here is shredded whole it's the whole chicken shredded and put in um just some water so it would be chicken broth that's in there this here is blueberry jelly and or i'm sorry blueberry jam this here is dill spears this is canned corn and yes it does have a slice of tomato on top it's a little trick with canned corn next year. I will show you all how I did that um, when I do can, when I when corn season is around again. But um, Corey's grandmother, um, which would come from an Amish background, she's the one that taught me that, to put a slice of tomato on the top of your corn and it will help it not taste as stale and canned corny. <laughs> and then you all saw me can this a week or two ago. Um, that's peppers and onions and the juice from that, the broth off of that is amazing. That's one thing I love about canned goods is reusing every part of it as much as I possibly can. This is a bread and butter pickle. This over here is what we call berry sauce and it's just raspberries, blueberries, all the berries and applesauce all cooked and made together. So it's kind of like a flavored applesauce. This is canned pumpkin. I might've mentioned that earlier, canned pumpkin and then the potatoes. And then this here is canned blueberries. So I can, if I run out of my, any of my jams, I can open one of these up and make more jam if I need to. But the blueberries again, yogurt, granola, um, ice cream. There's so many uses for it and it doesn't have that freezer taste, which I tend to pick up on a lot in frozen berries. So I really like that. If we're gonna make a smoothie with them, we just throw ice in with the canned berries. So that's just a little taste. I am getting ready very soon. As, as soon as I can get it organized with all the other projects I have going on, I, I'm going to do a tour of our cellar and just show you all um, how I store all of these things because you know, these are little samples of a lot of what I have but you know for potatoes you can you might want to see how I store up 200 pounds of potatoes in jars <laughs> so we love having the ease of having canned goods it makes things so much easier because you can dump them out of the jar and warm them up and it really kind of is the ultimate meal prep <laughs> um, when it comes to just being able to get dinner on the table very quickly. So I hope that this video helped you. I know it was a little long, but I thought it would be worth sharing and just telling you my experience, especially for those of you out there that are diving into this canning world or diving into traditional canning and knowing how people do different things. Um, I may in a year or two do an update of a video similar to this, but for now, this will be the reference video for anyone that asks me how I can. And if you're new here, I'd love it if you subscribed. I do a lot of lifestyle videos of a homeschool mom, a mom that makes things on, um, of her own. I am also really learning a lot about herbs and how to make tinctures and home remedies and things like that right now that I'm excited to share with you once I've mastered some of that. Um, and of course, a lot of meal prep and just cooking home cooked meals. So don't forget to leave me a comment below. I love to read your comments and I'll do my best to respond to them the best that I can. Be kind in the comments. Everybody has their own ways of doing things. Give this video a like and I'll see you all in my next video.